Hey guys, so right now there is a tragic time in the U.S. Uh, because of the murder of George Floyd by a police officer in the state of Minnesota. And I practice law in San Jose, California, and I want to tell you a couple of things, namely that the legal system is an ecosystem, that a police officer is only one part of an entire system that for the most part is rotten to the core not only because of nepotism, but a lot of other issues. And so it's quite unfair to blame only the police officers for the situation that's unfolding across the United States. And if we continue to focus on one part of the ecosystem, what's gonna happen is all the other, without touching and reforming all the other parts, nothing will change. And I've said this, I've actually been talking about corruption for the last 15 years and no one's listened to me. That's fine. Maybe. You know, maybe people will listen to me now. The moment that I knew that the system was rigged was when I saw a judge in a Starbucks hugging one of the defense lawyers in the city of San Jose. Now, typically, judges are, are subject to, actually, it was a presiding judge. She, she was a presiding judge at one point in time. And there's a couple of problems with this. There are judicial ethics called the canon of ethics, where judges are supposed to avoid the appearance of, you know, improper behavior. So not only actual behavior, but the appearance. And what you notice is that, you know, not just this one instance, I'll give you some other examples as well, but this is some, not something I would ever be able to do, of course, right, or, or ever feel comfortable doing uh, to a government employee uh, that has substantial power not only over the city, the county, but me, because I'm, I'm, you know, I was an officer of the court. And so you're subject to another, you're, you're also subject to ethics rules as well. Every lawyer has to take, you know, a multiple, you know, at the time, a multiple choice ethics test, which for the most part, no one studies for it because the test is garbage. I mean, you can, you don't have to study for it. You can pass it without looking at it. It's not true for all the other tests. When I saw that, you have a couple of things where you realize this business, this, this, this is just a business like everything else. The longer you're in there, the more you gain trust and the more you're, you're able to have access to essentially the an inside track on how to get things done. And one of the biggest problems is that a lot of lawyer, a lot of judges typically specialize in only one thing, and especially if they're DAs. So if you elect, if you vote for a DA to go into a uh, judicial office, you know, nine times out of 10, you, if you show up in court, are gonna be dealing with an insurance issue, uh, insurance coverage, uh, or a personal injury claim of some sort, something that the judges have probably, if you're a DA, have probably never dealt with before. And you notice on the Supreme Court, Sotomayor, Sotomayor is, I believe, the only justice who at some point ran her own law firm for a number of years. And you'll notice how, how much more to the left, how much more liberal she is, and how much more protective of minorities she is. I, I don't know much about Sotomayor, but I have to believe that when you compare her to the other justices on the court, it's not necessarily her ethnicity or her gender that gives her that sort of, not, not, not even empathy, just an awareness of the, of the ecosystem that she's dealing with. It's really her, her personal experience running that law firm. And it's a tough one. It takes a personal toll because I don't think she has any children and I think Sotomayor is divorced. So this is not this is not knowledge you gain easily and it's certainly not knowledge you gain just by hugging all the lawyers in town, um, regardless of how you know, good the reputation of both people are, the judge and the lawyer in that, in that instance. Um, and so the reason that, you know, you have this vicious cycle where good citizens, uh, law-abiding citizens trust the police in their city or trust dead, and they vote for the DA to come in because the DAs are always on a platform uh, typically sponsored by the police unions or the police union, union lobbies of being tough on crime. Now, you know, of course, what that really means is that if you go to court, your judge is probably going to be dependent on his or her relationship with either the lawyers in town as well as the staff within that facility, within that courthouse that's dealt with all these cases before. Most of the time in the state court, Judges do not read the papers that your lawyer submits. Here's the other problem. Most lawyers take on a bunch of cases and then they only, you know, so have a form. At one point in time, it's not just the judges, right? I'm, I'm trying to explain that it's a whole ecosystem. Um, it's a club. 
And if the club is, is almost set up to create a barrier uh, between the public and everything and, and, and the status quo. In other words, you know, you, it's, it's, it's a situation where you're not really supposed to change things. You're not really supposed to represent your clients, you know, as to the best of your ability. What you're supposed to do is just create a barrier for that person, to, uh, you know, make it, you know, so, th so the person gets paid and goes away, hopefully from an insurance policy. And you can think about this. Why does Warren Buffett, you know, Warren Buffett, all these really, really rich people in America, a lot of them have ties to insurance and real estate. Warren Buffett is basically an insurance salesman. Charlie Munger sells insurance, right? He's a lawyer, but how did he get rich? Worked with Warren Buffett in selling insurance um, and doing a lot of other things. The reason that they're able to invest so much is because they make so much money from premiums uh, on the, you know, within the insurance business, they have to spend that money, um, you know, elsewhere. So they have to invest it. So, you know, again, an ecosystem. Now, if you elect a judge who's formerly a DA, now what ends up happening is that judge has 25 cases that day. Each of them may have you know, 100, case, 100 pages to read or more, depending on what motion it is. If it's a, if it's a procedural motion, probably not a big deal, like an ex parte. Um, you know, but if it's, a, if it's a motion for summary judgment, you're probably going to look at 500 pages for that one case on the docket that day. So each judge has a staff in state court as well as federal court. And what ends up happening is, you know, they read a memo that's given to them. Now, the Supreme Court justices, including Sotomayor, they also have a memo. But if you listen to the, to the interviews, they also read all of the motions that are submitted. Some of the judges will also read all of the amicus briefs, which would, in some cases, you know, up the page count to maybe even 10,000 pages for one case. And so not all, not all, oh, no, if you look at the interviews, uh, I don't believe all the judges on the Supreme Court read all the papers, but they have a, they, they basically have a staff that does it for them and gives them a, gives them a memo. What I'm trying to tell you that, that is that in my experience, even somebody who became the presiding judge in Santa Clara County was not even reading a, a no, a substantive motion. It's not, not an outside paper that came in, um, but just the actual papers that were, uh, that were involved in perhaps dismissing, potentially dismissing the entire case, which if you make it that far, is quite a task. You know, you're spending thousands of dollars on depositions, um, a lot of other things. Now, when you elect that person, right, as opposed to a public defender or somebody who's had, had his or her own law firm or done some civil work, what you're creating is yet another political structure that is based on, you know, third party information and nepotism. So the judges end up in those situations, uh, just trusting whoever shows up more, most often. And you know, remember, they're not necessarily reading all the papers. So, you know, as long as the law clerks don't, you know, give them something that's, you know, extremely problematic, you, you are at a disadvantage unless you go to that lawyer who's in a position where he or she has worked long enough to work his or her way up the political chain, to be in a position to hug somebody in a Starbucks who's, by the way, bound by a judicial canon of ethics that prevents the appearance of improper behavior. Um, now, I happened to be, at the time, somewhat popular because I was, you know, you know I, I would represent my clients zealously. I wouldn't do a form. I, I, when I would go up against lawyers on the other side that were, you know, senior to me, some of them were using a font from 20 years ago. I don't know if they had the dot matrix printers, but... Um, the, you could tell that they hadn't changed, they hadn't upgraded to Word or WordPerfect, uh, the latest version, in about 10 to 20 years, because they were still using the same format, the same formatting and the same, you know, I, I could tell, because I've worked with these, you know, software systems for a long time, since high school. So uh, most lawyers don't really deal with you as, as an individual. They take your case in, they have a format, they have all these motions, they maybe haven't updated the cases within the pages, uh, the, the briefs uh, for five years or more, and they sort of keep going on. Someone like me, when I, when I, I would walk to work and I would park uh, in a place that, was, that would force me to walk past the law library. Now, every day, there are a, a ton of cases published just on the state level um, and that, that, are, that potentially have an impact on your, on your cases. Um, and, you know, some of them are procedural, 
which is still important because if you don't master the procedural rules, then you've got a problem on the substance on the substance side. You, you won't even be able to get to the substance of that case. Now, what's what's interesting is that I would go in and, and it would just be me sitting there and you know opening up this um, you know daily publication. I think it's called the Daily Reporter. Um, but you know it would and I would read all the summaries. I wouldn't you know, and that would take me an hour just for one day. There were, now, what ha ends up happening is the only people that would do that in a major law firm uh, would probably be the partners or extremely ambitious associates because they don't have the time. They have to bill. Now, I can't bill somebody. They have to bill $2,000 a year or whatnot uh, to make up for, you know, just to, to make up the economics. Well, I, I can't bill for, them, for my time. I'm doing it, you know, for the love of the game. Um, just because I, I thought that I had a, you know, sort of a role to play within this ecosystem that I thought was fairly essential, right? Access to the justice system. And so when you, when I was doing that, I can't bill my client for it. And law firms just like this, within this ecosystem have become a business. So if you can't bill for it, you know, chances are that it, it'll just sort of fall by the wayside. Now we talked, you know, this, there are some other issues as well. Um, you know, but you can see right away that you've got a system that almost by design uh, creates barriers for a lot of uh, access to justice. Now, keep in mind, you come out of school, uh, you're $100,000 in debt minimum, unless mommy and daddy pay your bills, right? And, you know, you've got a situation where, you know, you probably have to focus on, um, you know, paying paying clients. So that right away puts you at a disadvantage, right? If you, as a member of American society, do not have five to $10,000, you know, upfront to pay, and in some cases, right, you five thousand dollars would be the minimum you would need to get a case through to trial. You know, not not now trial itself is really expensive because you have to pay. You're the one paying the jury, right? They, they get paid some minimal amount every day, but times that times twelve or whatever, and you know, every day you've got some issues, right? The other court reporter that gets paid a lot of money. Uh, if you want a transcript, you've got you know same situation over and over again. So the costs all add up. Even bef now that's at trial before trial. You know, you've got a situation where you're still dealing with very expensive things like depositions and so on. Uh, sometimes an expert witness. Expert witnesses, you know, which can charge $200 an hour. So, um, minimum. So, um, you know, you can see right away there are some financial barriers as well. Chris Rock says that prices are the new discrimination. He's absolutely right. If, you know, in, in, in this case, within, the, within this ecosystem, you might not even be able to get your foot in the door. And so what, what really ends up happening is a lot of lawyers, they won't tell you, you know, when you come in because they're a business, um, they will oftentimes just take a bunch of cases and they'll try to settle it. And, and in fact, most cases settle, about 90 to 95% of cases settle civil on the, you know, overall. So it's not as if what you see on TV is really false, right? You don't see trials going on all the time. And in fact, criminal cases have priority over civil cases. So even if you do get you know, get all the way where you get a chance to go to trial, it's not as if there might not be a courtroom open. You might be sitting there paying your lawyer $100 an hour or $200 an hour just to wait uh, for a courtroom to open uh, or, or just be on standby, uh, you know, looking at all the different, you know, uh, you know, witnesses and so on. And that's really hard, by the way, when you have a lot of witnesses that have to come from, you know, a different city in a, in a state as big as California. Um, so, you know, because they have... Most, a lot of them, you know, have work, right? Or they have children to take care of. So you see this whole process, the procedure, just the procedure itself, um, you know, creates issues. Now, um, you've got another problem where, you know, the judges, like I said, a lot of them used to be DAs. Uh, um, if you go to Oakland, there are some court, the, the governments and the government in Oakland is pretty interesting. Uh, they've had a bunch of federal money come in. So a lot of the buildings are really nice. Um, but for some reason, they're also quite old. You know, if San Francisco had a fire, I'm not sure if, you know, a lot of buildings in Oakland seem pretty well preserved. And in one of the buildings, you know, the judges are have an opportunity to hang out with the district attorneys because they're apparently they're in the same building, um, the chambers and so on. So if you go to lunch, you get to see the same people every day. Uh, you know, you, you probably naturally build a sense of info, informal trust that positions you against outsiders in the same way that police uh, don't necessarily care about outside input. So you've got an, another club forming. 
Now within San Jose, uh, you also have this nepotism issue where you put on top of all that, uh, the mayor went and, and you know and the uh, police chief um, and most of the city council they all went to Catholic private schools. In fact, in the election, the first one that the mayor won and in the first term, he was up against another person who was Catholic who went to the same private Catholic high school as him. You've got this nepotism problem potentially, right? And guess what? To get into those Catholic schools, I believe it's about $25,000 a year now. So once again, remember what, I, what Chris Rock said? Prices are the, new, are the new discrimination. The chances of even someone like Sotomayor ever making it in a, in a position where she can you know, affect change are minimal. These days, Sotomayor just is, is almost always in the minority. So even if you get to the top, you may have very little impact. Uh, you know, right now, Trump's executive orders are sailing through. Sotomayor may write an opinion that's very persuasive, but it doesn't make an impact. Um, in many cases, she's, her opinions are there for show because she's not part of the majority. So, you've, so it's hard to say someone as, as adept and as intelligent as Sotomayor could ever be considered window dressing or some sort of, you know, uh, again, the appearance of, you know, this justice system working. But that's what it is uh, at this point in time, with the court being the way it is. So you see all these different procedures within this ecosystem coming together. And, you know, what people end up doing is they blame the police. Um, and of course, one of the reasons is that most people just don't understand the law. It's too complex. And it's, it's that way for a reason. But everyone understands, you know, a knee in the back of the head for eight minutes uh, you know, that's something that we can all understand is not just, but all these other th patterns within this ecosystem, if they're not fixed, you know, you have to really almost see this, this situation where you now have such a complex system where almost every procedural, financial, and substantive, you know, hurdle to getting a fair trial um, is stacked against the, is stacked against most people. So, most disputes are again resolved civil on the civil side through insurance. And so you have this whole system where you don't actually have a system of justice. You have a system that's designed to maintain the status quo through insurance and this club that each, each little faction, whether it's the judges, the cops, even the private lawyers, they form themselves. And once you have these factions, they really operate against the access for the public in the way that you would think when you look at the Latin on top of the courthouse when you go in, which typically has something to say about, you know, equal justice before the law. So I think that's that's all I have at this point. Um, I hope, I hope again, that we, we don't, if, if there is going to be reform that's going to last, that it actually affects the entire ecosystem. Uh, because if it doesn't, nothing will change. Uh, you know, it's, it, nothing is ever single issue. Um, every issue at some point when it becomes complex involves multiple players and multiple factions. And if in whatever reform is passed, if it only affects one element within that system, um, you're just simply going to transfer the corruption elsewhere, or you're in a position where the people affected by the, by the legislation um, or the consent decree will simply shift resources into the private sector, uh, including employees that may have to leave as a result of the reform. Um, so uh, that's all I have to say now.